What's good, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the What's Good Games podcast, your source for video game news, commentary, analysis, and funny stuff every Friday. I'm Andrea Renee, joined by Miss Christine Steimer. Hello. And filling in for Miss Brittany Brombacher, it's the one and only Jessica Chobot. Hi. Thanks for having me. We are so glad I'm that we so were glad. finally able Yay. to get you on the show. Um, for people who possibly don't know, I don't know how they could not know who you are. Uh, Jessica is a, a lady of all trades. She is hosting the Bizarre States podcast. She's the founder of the Geek Chic fashion brand Vogue Leader. And uh, most recently, you guys may have seen her hosting on Discovery's Expedition X series. You are just wearing all kinds of hats. Plus, you're working on your own content on your YouTube channel, too. Yeah, yeah, it's been a little bit of everything. Yeah, Bizarre States, well, we actually changed the name because we left Nerdist and we revamped it. And so now it's called The Untold Hour and it Ooh. rolls out of Starburns audio. And so, but it's essentially the same thing. Like, it's just a name change, basically. Um, and so that's been a lot of fun. And I had done that in order to get into the paranormal because I've always really liked it. And that ended up leading me into doing the Expedition X show for Discovery. So that's how that bridge kind of got built. And then, um, yeah. And so then in the meantime, I was just like, well, I've got all this extra free time now because once Expedition X wrapped, it was like a lot of work for three to four months. And then, you know, once you shoot everything, it's in the can, you're done. So I had all this extra free time and I was like, oh, I might as well, let's, let's try the YouTube channel thing. Let's see how it goes. And, uh, it's been a lot of fun. That's awesome. Yeah, it's yeah. one of those kind of like you have to sit around and wait things that is frustrating as uh, somebody who does a lot of on camera and producing work. You're like, okay, cool. My project was really fun and now I don't have a project yet. And so got to go look for another project. <laughs> yeah. And the thing too is like, I don't, I'm at a point I think in my career where, and especially after the Expedition X thing where that was the one thing I had left to do that I really wanted to do. Like, it's the one thing, like the paranormal, dipping my toe in that space, having a, a fun show like that was the one thing that was kind of left on my bucket list item of things I would want to do as a host. And when that landed, I was like, okay, well, everything from here on out is kind of icing or, you know, icing on the cake, cherry on top of the sundae, however you want to say it. Uh, and so then I figured, well, I'm not going to wait around to find the perfect show because that really is just whatever at this point. Like I've, I've done my perfect show. I had the Expedition X show, which for me was perfect. So now I'll just do the fun stuff that I've always wanted to do and explore that I've never really gotten a chance to let have a moment to breathe. And that's where the Vogue leader comes in. That's where my... Um, personal YouTube channel comes in and then, you know, who knows where it'll, it'll lead to. I'll tell you, considering the situation we are currently in with the pandemic, I'm really glad I decided to launch a YouTube channel <laughs> show before I, uh, before everything, um, forced everybody to watch nothing but the internet and TV. Yeah. You know, yeah. talk about coincidental timing. It's a good time for me to have a studio at my house. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Very fortuitous. Yeah. So I am bummed though that we don't have you here in the studio, but once, you know, we hopefully, you know, get out of the situation that we're currently in, we would love for you to come back, especially when we can have Brittany come down. Um, and speaking of which, you guys obviously didn't notice that Brittany isn't here with us this week. Um, she is taking care of some family stuff. Um, but we are super glad that Jessica could be here. We don't have a ton of time with her, though. So we're going to go ahead and just get right into some things. I do have a couple of quick announcements. If you guys missed it, Britt did an unboxing video of her Resident Evil 3 Collector's Edition. Um, there's plenty of your favorite Brit faces abounding in that video. It's actually pretty funny. And she does like a little mini recap slash review slash spoiler cast at the end of the video. So if you haven't played it yet, you might want to wait to watch that. Um, and I was talking with Rihanna after last week's episode and she was like you know it'd be really fun if we put together a what's good gains community movie night a lot of people are doing these netflix watch alongs and so i said that sounds like a great time so we decided to do a what's good games movie matinee and it's going to take place on saturday april 18th at 11 a.m pacific time so mark it in your calendars if you guys want to join us uh, for a watch along because we found out that they're streaming mortal Kombat on netflix <laughs> And I 
love nice. that movie so much. Um, and so we will be promoting that on social again if you guys are like, ooh, that sounds fun. So hopefully you guys can join us at twitch.tv slash what's good games for that. And speaking of which, if you guys haven't caught us on the Monday show yet, live at 11 a.m. Pacific time every Monday on our Twitch channel. It's a fun, like shorter version of the show. Hopefully you guys have listened to it in your podcast feed. And because we made our affiliate status, I've been slowly adding emotes. And now not only is the Brit emote live the steimer emote is live as well oh <laughs> congratulations <laughs> steimer is forever going to be in, in graphical form it's it's adorable and cute um i'm working on mine i found a really funny face that i am making because the thing about picking twitch emotes is that you don't want to just pick something that is kind of generic you want to have something that you want people to use in a very specific way and that has been harder for me to figure out than I anticipated. <laughs> um, but I yeah, think I got to have a little bit of something, something. Yeah. So I think I have, I think I have one. It's kind of like an, oh no face. So like, oh no, like that kind of, oh no. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, thank you so much to this month's Patreon producers. Chewie's Godson, Alex Rogopoulos, Ferris Atay, Mohammed Mohammed, Marcus Brown, Punctified, and Male Bittner. And welcome to our Patreon community at patreon.com slash what's good games. This week, it's Wavy Chula, Marcus, Steph Maurizio, Christopher Zorn, Pupfire, Tuck Bonham, Luke Lore, Pineapple Pizza Sucks MD. I see what you did there. Uh, <laughs> William game. Specht Casper, Matthew Proietto, Toy Meeling, and Alfred Printup. Thank you so much to everybody for supporting everything we do here at What's Good Games on our Patreon page. Um, we're going to skip the podcast reviewers for this week because I kind of want to leave that as Brett's thing. And I think it's time to get into the news. But one more message before we do that, and it's a message from one of our sponsors here at What's Good Games. It's Honey. So we've talked about Honey before because they make online shopping easy, and boy, oh boy, is everybody doing online shopping these days. But what can sometimes be challenging about it is finding the coupon codes that you want that actually work. You always type them in, and it's not valid, or it expired, or the thing in your cart doesn't work. Well, good news. If you've got Honey, then those problems are going to be a thing of the past. Honey is the free online shopping tool that saves you money online. Honey automatically finds the best promo codes and applies them to your cart, which makes shopping finally feel as easy as it's supposed to be. Now imagine you're shopping at one of your favorite sites, Target, Best Buy, Sephora, Macy's, etc. You go to checkout, a little box drops down, and then all you have to do is click apply coupons. You wait a few seconds for it to scan every promo code they can find on the internet and boom, watch the prices drop. So I was recently using Honey when I was shopping at Target actually um, because I decided that I really needed candles. So I kind of have a oh, candle my finish. Oh yes. Right? <laughs> and I was like, you yes. know, I need more candles in my life. Um, and what's great about Honey is that I don't have to go like Google Target promo code. You just click the button and boom, uh, Honey applies everything for you. Or if you already have the best price, they let you know that too. So you don't waste your time going and searching for codes that are never going to work for you anyway. So it's been a really great time for me with Honey because I – also love building honey gold which you can then cash in for gift cards for stuff that you're buying anyway and it's a super easy browser extension to install um, and honey supports over 30,000 stores online and something that they're adding more to every single day and the users that use honey also love it because it has over 100,000 five-star reviews on the google chrome store that's a lot of people leaving five-star reviews steimer do you think someday what's good games can get a hundred thousand five-star reviews <laughs> I, it's a it's a goal to shoot for. <laughs> We're gonna I'll try to catch up to you. Honey. I'm gonna download it right now. Actually, I've got yes. nothing but candles online. <laughs> well, if you want to join Jessica and, and get honey, you gotta go to joinhoney.com/slash what's good. Because not using Honey is literally passing up free money. It's free to use and installs in just two clicks. And if you want to help out, what's good games? Go to joinhoney.com slash what's good to get honey for free that's joinhoney.com slash what's good start saving money on your candles today <laughs> Shit, i just signed up like i did it <laughs> like, thank you so much <laughs> <laughs> seriously though it's I great I was like wait well this sounds great this sounds exactly <laughs> like what I would use this for perfect yeah and the the gold really racks up over time like I hadn't checked on it in a while and then I logged back in and I had over like 12,000 
honey gold. So I ordered like a hundred dollar Amazon gift card and I was very excited about it. Um, Heck yeah. Yeah. So even if you're on a site and honey doesn't have a code because there's just no codes available for, um, at that given time, um, what they'll do is that you can still earn gold by um, being logged in through your browser extension. Um, so it's, it's nice. It's free stuff. Love right. free stuff. Okay. okay here we go. Uh, the first story is kind of a fun one. Introducing DualSense. The new wireless game controller for PlayStation 5. So I'm not going to go through this entire write-up from the PlayStation blog, um, but I have it all here for you ladies if you want to take a look. I think what's been really interesting about watching the reactions to the controller, obviously the look seems to be very divisive. It's the first time that PlayStation has done a two-tone look. I'm going to just look at the specific thing about the colors so on the blog um, it says now let's talk about the colors decided on a two-tone design additionally we changed the position of the light bar that will give it an extra pop it now sits at each side of the touchpad giving it a slightly larger look and feel so it's interesting to me that they decided to keep the light bar I was kind of hoping that they were going to get rid of it um, I also am hoping that they are going to allow you to turn the light bar off because that's really a big drain on battery life, which is why the DualShock 4 had such a notoriously short battery life is because of that of that light bar. Uh, what do you ladies think of the look of this controller? Uh, I love it. <laughs> I think it's really, I think, I know a lot of people say, oh, it's looking more and more like an Xbox controller. I mean, I can see why they're saying that, but to me, the way that they have managed to to still kind of streamline, I'm looking at it right now while we're talking, still kind of streamline the two sides where you would rest your hands on the top, you know, like, like mm -hmm. the outline of it, the like actual, what you'll actually be holding is definitely a lot bigger and a little bit more Xboxy. but image wise, the way that they were ma they managed to kind of keep that same shape that the PlayStation controllers are known for. I, you know, I don't, I see it. I'm like, yeah, okay. I, I buy this. This is like, fa you know, phase five for PlayStation. And I kind of dig it. And anything that looks a little bit more, um, a little bit more futuristic and all that jazz is kind of up my alley. I like the light bar being there. I, I know, yes, drain, definite drain on battery life, but I am a lot of style over substance sometimes <laughs> so <laughs> fair enough yeah so for me I'm like wow that looks really sexy if anything else I would say I'd want it to be brighter like a brighter blue so that it really pops but um I did see some fan mock-ups of it look being all matte black and that also looked just as lovely oh so yeah hopefully they that was a that. question from one of our patrons, Beatrice Manrich wrote, what's your favorite fan-made skin of the DualSense controller so far? We are seeing a lot of mock-ups of the DualSense. So you... I actually haven't seen any, but that's interesting that you say that. I think actually the two-tone is more interesting to me only because what they visually have done with it by blocking out with the black is they made it look more like the old boomerang um, controller of years past, I don't remember which PlayStation that was, but like, like they made it look more boomerangy shape just by mm -hmm. doing that. But I feel like that would be lost if you did it all matte black, and then it would just look like an Xbox controller. Well, so that mm -hmm. will, yeah, kinda. If you do it all matte black, because it reminds you more of the traditional PlayStation color scheme, it doesn't seem as Xboxy. I don't, I don't know. To me, the white, the two tone, looks more Xboxy, but at the same time, I still enjoy it. The matte black looks more traditional PlayStation, but um, yeah, I don't know. I'm torn. Like, listen, at the end of the day, as long as it works, that's all I care about. Yeah, I just want to like hold it and get a sense for how it feels because yes. again, when I saw it, I was like, oh, it's chunkier. It, seems, it looks a little chunkier than normally the PlayStation controllers are. And that can either be a good thing or a bad thing for me. If it's more of like an Xbox controller shape I'm fine with that like that size works but if it's anything a little fatter than that I'm not I'm, it's going to be more difficult for me to hold well a tiny baby hand. It, it's good that you <laughs> mentioned that because apparently PlayStation is thinking about this as well um, they say that their design teamed 
uh, worked closely with the harbor engineers about the placement of triggers and actuators, specifically wanting to be, you know, um, cognizant of the fact that if they didn't place them correctly, it would make the controller feel bulkier. Um, they said that the designers were then able to draw the lines of how the exterior of the controller would look and feel with the challenge of making the controller feel smaller than it really looks. Um, they also said that, let's see here, I'm talking about haptic feedback. I thought that they said they were specifically, maybe I cut that, I trimmed that part out of this. They were talking specifically about making it for a more wider variety of hand sizes. Oh yeah, at the bottom here. DualSense has been tested by a wide range of gamers with a variety of hand sizes in order for us to achieve the comfort level we wanted with great ergonomics. So. I mean, that's good. I actually feel like all, like at this point, this generation and, and, and even the one previous, for the most part, I mean, in general, for the most part, all of these controllers feel really good currently like it's hard like at all the tweaks and all the advancements that we're going to have at this point out feel like they're going to be like tiny little things and a lot of just visual rather than structural even though i'm sure a lot of work goes into the structural but like christine was saying as long as they keep it kind of within you know just for the reference of xbox as long as they kind of keep it in that that wheelhouse of shape size and not go any bigger i think that is I think that's a good kind of generalized size for everyone. Yeah. You know, maybe you go one. I, I don't know. I just, I feel like the, these controllers that we currently have are, are also still really, really good. And uh, I just don't know what you could do to change that, to improve it by like leaps and bounds rather than like small little tweaks here and there. Yeah. I think that it's that's all about a... those minor improvements to quality of life. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's, that's true. The next generation. I mean, that's all we can really ask for. I'm not, I don't want them to reinvent the wheel here. I think that this looks cool. I think that, you know, the, you know, the steps that they're taking to make it more innovative are going to not really be something that you're going to understand until you get to play a game with it and feel what they mean mm -hmm. about integrating audio with the triggers and changing the way that they're integrating rumble with gameplay etc cetera, etc cetera. it sounds cool but like that to me is all like i don't really need that stuff i think it's i think it's a nice added bonus but i just need mm -hmm. to feel good i need the sticks and the buttons to feel good and if it's you know just an iteration of dual shock 4 then i'm in because i really liked the dual shock 4 <sighs> yeah I, I mean there's never been a game that's had audio and like audio used within the controller that's really blown my mind i think the only little addition add-on that i was ever really like whoa that's super cool was like rumble and other than that it's like oh that's neat that you know when i use this thing i can hear a baby crying but through my <laughs> controller but i don't really i know. hated that I in death stranding i hated it i was like make I mean, it, it stop really, yeah <laughs> It didn't really do anything for me weird. or make the game. If anything, it kind of took me out of the game because I'm like, wait, where's that sound coming from? And then I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, God. Oh, my controller? Ugh. You know, it's not... in the controller. It's in the controller. <laughs> it's like... I don't know. Well, we will keep well, an eye on PlayStation for the upcoming reveal of the box. There are also lots of people who are doing mock-ups of what the box could look like and if it's going to match the controller. Um, I love watching people's imaginations run wild, but I have a feeling they're going to keep the box up probably a little bit more um, streamlined and probably won't go two-tone. It better be two-tone. Two because if you're going to make a two-tone controller, the box best follow. Listen, I, you know, I'm in. I'm in. Um, all right. Speaking of their competitor, Xbox had an Inside Xbox episode this week. And Kotaku did a little write-up. I'm not going to read every single one of these bullet points because they did cover quite a few things in the Inside Xbox. But I think some of the highlights for me uh, were that we learned that the Xbox Series X games can be stored on any external hard drive, that they'll need to be moved to the internal memory or the official Seagate expansion drive in order to play them because that was a big thing people were kind of up in arms about after they unveiled some of the details about Xbox and their proprietary hard drives. So interesting to know. Still a little bit of a pain in the butt, but I guess, you know, it's kind of a compromise, at least for the time being. Um, there's going to be a bunch of new games coming to Xbox Game Pass, including Journey to the Savage Planet, which has been one of my faves so far this year. Um, there's also Football Manager 2020 is coming. And then um, Mist over and stranger things three the game i never ended up playing that did either of you play the stranger things game i did not no i did not yeah i didn't either oh well maybe a way to check it out because it's free on xbox game pass um they I'll also say, i love that games pass yeah i love it love it it's okay so good 
Yeah, I use it constantly. We we were talking right before we started recording that you are playing Sea of Thieves right now. Yeah. So I'm playing Sea of Thieves with my son because my nephew, who lives in Michigan, uh, plays it as well. And they want to hang out with each other. And so I was trying to, A, figure it out for myself because I figure, well, now that we're all stuck in the house, I might as well play it as well. I might as well play it as well. I might as well play it too. And uh, and uh, also to keep an eye on my kid. And it's been a lot of fun. It's super, super, it's super fun. And it's just nice that, because, you know, I was like, I didn't realize it was available on the Game Pass when I first thought up the idea to do this with, the like, our nephew and my kid. So... I was like, oh, how am I going to get the game? Like, I'm going to have to download it digitally. Well, you know, our internet situation at the house right now, because everybody at home is kind of garbage, so it's going to take forever to download. Da, 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 da. Okay, well, you know, it's just like nothing I couldn't do, but a lot of steps to get there, of and a lot of like pre-worry of am I going to be able to accomplish downloading this game because I can't go out and run out and grab whatever I need to grab. And, uh, and not that that's any different of how you normally live your life with games. Cause I'm pretty much fully digital anyway, but it was just like, huh, I don't want to deal with this right now. And then I walked over there and it was like, Hey, free on game pass. And I'm like, yes, dink <laughs> and hit the button and <laughs> let it download. And it downloaded really fast and it was great. And we were good to go. That's awesome. Yeah, so they yeah. did announce this week that the next Sea of Thieves update is happening on April 22nd. Uh, it's called Ships of Fortune, and it features an expanded reputation system, an overhauled competitive mode, new cosmetics, and perhaps most importantly, cats, everybody. We can have a cat. Pet sea of kitty thieves. cats. Um, About time. Oh, you weren't allowed to have cats on a ship. I thought they were bad luck. Well, cats and women were not allowed on ships. <laughs> On pirate ships, right? That was the thing. I, I mean, the, that was the thing. The women That's thing, I definitely you. know because I'm rewatching Pirates of the Caribbean right now, the whole series, um, and they talk about that a lot in the first couple movies. Um, but the cats thing makes sense too because cats don't really want to be around water, and with the way that boats move around, it feels very anti-cat. Um, right? Yeah, maybe the cats will like stay on shore. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> They'll wait for you at port. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. Well, I mean. That would be cute. I don't, I, cats don't generally like run up to you like a dog does, right. but they could. I'm going to look this up. I had a cat that did. Do cats go on pirate ships? I'm looking it up. <laughs> okay. While she <laughs> looks that up, Google. I'm going to just quickly recap a couple of the things, then we're going to move on to our next story. As I mentioned, we're moving at a clip here this week, everybody. Oh, wait. Wait, wait. They were. Wait. Cats okay. were an excellent animal to have on board seafaring For vessels, rats? especially pirate ships. Mm. Yes. To kill all the ra the ratty poos that come on board. Yeah, that's cool. Lisa. Okay, there you go. Today I learned that just that just sent me on a on a <laughs> hole into were there any cats on the Titanic? I don't know. Let's find out. <laughs> there were. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> that's horrible guys. news. I know that sucks. Uh, how oh, much is it cats. to ship cat? I don't know. I don't know. We could go. That that's a that's a sidebar. Uh, podcast right okay there. so when, when we have you into the studio we'll make that the the topic of our conversation <laughs> the weird and random places that you can find cats in history um <laughs> if you guys want to check out the rest of the uh recap kotaku has it all written up for you um something that i just wanted to mention also was that um i know a lot of people are looking forward to minecraft dungeons that is going to be releasing on may 26th in case you guys were um, anxious about that game. It got a lot of really good, um, not reviews, but previews from other members of the press that I know. They got a chance to, to get hands-on time with it. So, um, all right, let's move on to our final story of this segment. Uh, Google Stadia is now free to anyone with a Gmail address, writes Polygon. So the That's a lot of people. I mean, that is a lot of people. I would be curious how many people have Gmail addresses. They probably have never publicly announced that. And there's people that have multiple know. emails. It probably doesn't even matter. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, back to the story. Um, Stadia is now free to anyone with a Gmail address, the company announced this week. To sweet the deal, Google is giving new users two months of Stadia Pro, including access to nine games for free. Existing Pro subscribers won't be charged for the next two months of service, Google has said. Previously, access to Stadia required purchasing the $129 Premier Edition, a bundle that included a Chromecast Ultra, a wireless Stadia controller, and three months of Stadia Pro. 
the service offered free games and video streams up to 4K resolution and 60 frames a second in HDR lighting. As of April 8th, access to the base level version of Stadia uh, games that stream at a maximum resolution of 1080p will be free by signing up at the Stadia website. Uh, users still have to purchase games to own them, but those games uh, can be played on a PC, Chrome OS tablet, Google Pixel phone, and other supported Android devices. Still missing that iOS support. A Stadia controller can be purchased separately for $69, but is not required. Users can also play with a supported USB controller or a mouse and keyboard. Just as a quick recap, the games that you can get with Stadia Pro, Destiny 2 The Collection, Grid, Guilt, SteamWorld Dig 2, SteamWorld Quest, Hand of uh, Hilgamesh. 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 <laughs> the Serious Sam Collection, Spitling, Stacks on Stacks on Stacks, and Thumper. After the two-month trial, of course, you'll be paying $9.99 a month. Of course, you can cancel if you so choose. And it's interesting that I'm glad Polygon brought this into their article. Google is also making a change to Stadia Pro's default streaming resolution in an effort to manage bandwidth, similar to efforts of Netflix, Disney, and Sony Interactive Entertainment, according to Stadia Vice President and General Manager Phil Harrison. Um, so essentially what they're doing is they're doing the default resolution down to 1080p instead of 4K. Uh, this is not surprising. We were just talking about how we're all experiencing internet woes right now, kind of across the board. And so it does make a service like Stadia kind of feel like a, oh, feels like Stadia was never designed for this. Um, but it's <laughs> interesting that they're, you know, finally adding this. I'm actually surprised it took this long because it was a big thing that they were talking about, making sure that there was going to be like a base Stadia available. And now it's already, you know, midway through April. And this came out in November of last year. So, um, Jessica, you said that you have a Stadia, but it's not in use at the moment. <laughs> it still has not been removed from its box. <laughs> we have the Founders Edition. Um, I think the concept behind Stadia, although not really technically new because we've had this kind of iteration before, is still a great idea, which is why we got the Founders Edition. But the problem is, and I, it's the games. There's nothing on there or made available for me that I feel is necessary to play and open the box for. I mean, maybe Destiny, but mm -hmm. I've already played it. Um well, and I, I'm not, I don't disagree with you. I 100% agree. I think the thing that they, that Stadia isn't really pushing is the games that are cross play or cross progression. Like it went really under the radar that the division two was launched on Stadia. And it's one of the only places that you can do cross play in the division. You can't mm -hmm. like, I can't do cross play on my PS4 copy of the division, but I can cross play with PC players if I'm playing on Stadia and the cross progression is great because it means that I can bring everything with me and I don't have to start over. But like a lot I mean, of stuff is, sorry, go ahead. I mean, that's, I was going to say, that's definitely like a, an exceptionally good selling point, but only if you play those games, exactly. I, that's not my default gameplay type of gameplay. Like I, you know, I've dabbled, but I'm not, I, none of that really interests me. And I'm not saying that just because it doesn't interest me, it's not going to interest others. But I think that combined with the fact that there's not the best library out there ever um, makes it harder for people that might be interested in it to get on board. Could not disagree with that statement at all. The only game that I've spent a substantial amount of time playing on Stadia is Darksiders Genesis because it mm -hmm. came out on Stadia for console first and then came to the other consoles later. And so I really enjoyed my time with that game. But given everything that's happening with the bandwidth situations kind of across the board with, you know, um, ISPs, particularly in the United States, I don't, I can't speak for how it is, you know, in other countries, it just feels like Stadia is just kind of in a bad, in a bad moment right now. And that they, if I was on the Stadia marketing team, I would kind of pull back any kind of PR beats that we had planned until, we're through this moment. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I kind of look, yes, I look at, yes, I totally agree. I also don't, I think while they're in a tough spot, everybody's kind of in a tough spot. I mean, and so I like the fact that they're making this available in such a way to people that are stuck at home right now. I think that's very kind. Um, certainly not something that they have to do and also very smart. 
as from a business perspective, like maybe you never know people are stuck at home. If they get a chance to try it out, maybe they'll you pick this up permanently and this will become their default thing. Cause now they've had two months or however long we're going to be stuck at home to get used to it. Mm -hmm. So I think it's both very nice and thoughtful and very smart business wise. But I, but aside from that, like if this hadn't been happening right now and they announced something like this or, or, or maybe not, maybe it was just like more stuff for stadia, but it wasn't any improvement in their library. I don't know if it, would I it would even be on my radar yep you're not alone Steimer what's your thoughts on on Stadia are you excited to play stuff on Stadia or you you, do you kind of feel how we feel oh I you should you should already know this I don't care about Stadia (laughs) like but I think it is more of what what Jess was saying like there's not a reason for me to care about Stadia there's nothing I want to play that I can't play anywhere else and I already have everything else so Give me a reason and I'll have a reason. Well, yeah, I think I think that's that. Um, Okay, so just a quick in case you missed it. I'm trying to find, you know, some good feel good stories that are happening around the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, one of the ones that I wanted to highlight this week is right here in local to the Los Angeles area. So a lot of you out there probably have heard of the fantastic art house. I am 8-Bit. They have worked on a bunch of different events and projects over the years, but they also have an art gallery here in Los Angeles. And right down the street from that art gallery is a really cool barcade called Button Mash. I am 8-Bit has done several events there. A a lot of people that I know that live in the area um, hold their birthday parties and things there. It's just a really cool place for gamers to kind of get together and have drinks and play some cab games. Um, Obviously, because of the shelter in place, businesses are closed across the country and restaurant workers are among the hardest hit because they rely so heavily on day-to-day financing tips, um, business, et cetera. So I am a bit decided to hold a fundraiser for Button Mash. And what's great about it is even if you're not in the LA area and you've never heard of Button Mash, but you love I Am 8-Bit art and some of the games that they've helped work on, you can go to the I Am 8-Bit website and buy one of the quarantine boredom packs. They've got five different levels and in each of the levels um, includes different things. So for example, the $25 pack includes one video game, um, one coupon, which I believe is for Button Mash. You get Button Mash recipes, a printable coloring book and some tokens to play but the higher levels include video game soundtracks comics and then even in some of the the highest level includes a super rare piece of art Um, so if you guys are interested in helping support a local business here or if you just want to help i am 8-bit support them and you want to get some cool i am 8-bit stuff uh, you can check out that fundraiser at i'm 8-bit.com Okay, and I think that's going to do it for probably the shortest news segment we've ever done. I feel like we should do these at a clip more often. What do you think, Steimer? Yeah, <laughs> I'm just rocking and rolling. <laughs> I kind of liked it. Yeah. Like, yeah, okay, next story. Yeah, okay, hit me with it. Next story. Exactly. It, it flow. Keep it moving. Um, so we're going to take a short break. When we come back, um, we're going to do our segments a little out of order because as I mentioned, um, Jessica has some other commitments tonight. We're going to go ahead and use your questions to figure out what she's working on, get answers for you, and basically just, you know, I, I want to talk about Vogue later. I'm just going to say it. We're going to talk oh, okay, about cool. yes. Let's talk stuff. <laughs> Let's talk fashion. Yes. <laughs> okay, everybody. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. It is the second segment of the What's Good Games podcast. Like I mentioned, we're doing the third segment. I know it's uh, I I said we're doing it out of order. Oh, okay. Well, sure. Whatever. (laughs) (laughs) It's the third. That's topsy turvy day. Who knows what segment it is? It's okay. If you do, would you prefer I introduce it as the third segment? Oh, I don't care. Let's just roll. Okay. I'll just do <laughs> the I'll just is. do the intro Please again. Keep this in. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Fine. We're just gonna leave it in. We're doing it live, <laughs> everybody. Um so what we decided to do is um I obviously every week, you know, uh, we go to Patreon and ask for your questions. We also ask for your questions on Dear WGG and some of you tweeted some questions. 
um, because Jessica's here and she's working on so many cool projects. And I know a lot of you guys have a bunch of different questions about them. So before we get to mine, I do want to get to some of these viewer questions. Um, obviously, we want to talk about your very cool show that's on television right now. Before we get into the questions about it, where can people find Expedition, Expedition X? So Expedition X is on the Discovery Channel, and it usually rolls out right after Expedition Unknown. So if you go to your menu system in order to DVR it or something, you're, it, it's going to be kind of impossible to find. Just look for the big block of Expedition Unknown and let it run because we are in there. We start around 9, I believe 9 p.m. PST. And then from, so then basically it's an hour of Josh's Expedition uh, Unknown, then it's an hour of Expedition X, and then it's about an hour or 30 minutes, I can't remember which, of an after show called After the Hunt. And it's all in the menu system as Expedition Unknown. Um, currently, we are, uh, everybody's on hiatus. I believe there might be one more episode left that they're going to roll out Um sooner because I got the heads up you're going to be doing VO from your house call recently so um nice <laughs> but but because yeah but because of everything that happened everybody ended up having to go home so that kind of threw a, a, a bump in the road for us but I believe there's still one more episode left and then um from there I have heard although nothing specific that they will be running out an international cut and I'm sure they're going to be doing reruns as well. And then a friend of mine told me, everybody knows about this stuff but me. A friend of mine told me you can watch it on um, streaming on Discovery. So, yeah. Uh, so I actually found yeah. it there too. So if you go to go.discovery.com, um, you can watch, I believe, full episodes. Uh, so if you don't have cable or if you don't have like a YouTube TV equivalent, um, you could go to the Discovery website and, and watch it there. Thank goodness for internet streaming, man. Right, that's kind of how I only watch my TV at this point. Uh, I mean, same. We, streaming. We cut, yeah. we cut the cord. We weren't going to, but then because we, John and I, like to watch a lot of live sports, and that's very still heavily tied to cable. But thankfully, mm -hmm. you know, YouTube TV, Google made a big investment in getting licensing rights to a lot of live sports. So we went with YouTube TV and have been really enjoying it. But um, Dilbert Pickled had a question for you. Jessica, what's it like going on paranormal investigation adventures and what got you started with paranormal research? Well, um, it's super, super fun going on the adventures because these are places that have been on my paranormal bucket list. Uh, I like weird stuff, um, personal, personal bucket list of items for, gosh, since I was like in fifth grade. And so that's kind of where it all started. So in fifth grade, we had, <laughs> this is so sad. We had one copy of Oregon Trail in the library and I always wanted to play it. And there was always some friggin' kid sitting there and playing it way, way too long, never giving anybody else a turn. So what I would do is I would, instead of going out and playing in the uh, yard at lunchtime when we would have recess, I went to the library instead so that I could get like 30 minutes to an hour by myself on Oregon Trail. It worked great for a while until other kids figured out they could also do the same thing. So near like the middle to the end of that school year, other children would go and jump on there before I got a chance because everybody then would just try to rush and get on there. And so while, so if I wasn't able to get to Oregon Trail first, I would kind of sit and hover in the library and get super, super bitter and give like really nasty looks, trying to get them to leave and make them super <laughs> comfortable. And in the meantime, to occupy myself, I would read all of these weird mystery books. And so it kind of started with, and that's kind of where my obsession grew is that eventually I would read through like Greek mythology and I'd read all those books. And then that led into um, like Salem witch trials. And then I'd read all those books. And then that led into like time life mysteries of the unknown books. And so I would read all those. And so, and it kind of was just this one shelf of the library where all the weird stuff was. And I became super, super obsessed and I think that that's actually the connection between gaming and these paranormal shows for me is that now you're seeing Mothman and, you know, different kinds of cryptids show up in like Fallout 76. Whatever you think about that game is your own thoughts, but like they're there, you know, and that's stuff like you wouldn't normally have seen even maybe 10 years ago. So there's this weird crossover now 
of um, cryptids, paranormal. I mean, we have like a bunch of classic video games that kind of establish themselves in the horror genre with ghosts and weird uh, rituals and things like that, like Fatal Frame and Silent Hill and all that. And so I think it just kind of was a natural progression for me between the two worlds. And yeah. And so now that I get to go live it, I'm having a sh- I don't know if I can swear on here. You can. No, really you, you can definitely I'm swear. A shit ton of fun. Oh, good, because I dropped a fuck earlier, and I didn't know yeah, if you no, guys heard it or not. This okay. is, a, yeah, this yeah, is an M for Mature rated podcast. Um, I never would have anticipated that the genesis for your love of the paranormal originated with Oregon Trail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of. Yes. I mean, it was and even before that, like that was the real that I think Oregon Trail was the cement. It cemented it that like sixth grade, fifth grade. I've got nothing to do. I don't want to go socialize with other children. So I'm going to sit in the library by myself. That definitely cemented it. But it was even before that when I would sit there and when I was little, even before, you know, like when I was in like, oh, gosh, I'd say first grade my block of television was the A team and then um, Ripley's believe it or not. And then, so that was my jam and I would just sit there. And even though Ripley scared the bejesus out of me, I would watch it every time. And that was like a great chunk of television. And then as I got older, it shifted from Ripley's believe it or not into, um, you know, unsolved mysteries. And so it's just all these little bits and pieces that just kind of, meshed at the same time during my formative years and has turned me out into the very functional adult that I could, that you currently see before you. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. I'm, I'm super into that. And I love, I love when, you know, kind of origin stories have these really interesting, um, multi-layered, um, you know, story to them. Um, I do have a couple more questions here for you. So this one comes from Punctified. We actually had a couple of people uh, write very similar questions to Punctified question. And, and he writes, what was the biggest challenge in taking your love of spooky stuff and experience from your podcast to television format for Expedition X on Discovery Channel? I guess I never really asked you how involved you were with the production. Obviously, you were on camera talent, but did you also do uh, some of the producing for that show as well? Not really. They certainly asked us our opinion about what our interests were, where, if we could go anywhere, where we would go and why, um, you know, things of that nature, like which cryptid is your favorite? You know, like we all, like they definitely checked in with us, but you know, it's also as, as paranormal driven as Expedition X is, I think what gets lost in it to a certain extent is how physically demanding that job is as well because we are in Cambodia. So we're hiking through the rainforest by ourselves. We're in, you know, um, off the grid in the mammoth caves in Kentucky where they haven't even explored yet. And, and so there is this for keeping it in, keeping it in the video game family. It's, it's very much a, um, like Lara Croft, uncharted Tomb Raider esque, you know, Indiana Jones kind of, physicality that's involved with these shows as well. And so that being said, that is definitely not my wheelhouse <laughs> and, <laughs> and I suffered greatly and they, uh, I'm, I'm glad that they took the wheel on that because I don't think if I was trying to produce something that had that much involvement in regards to how tough it was just for these locations, I don't, I don't know if I would be able to pull it off. Like, I think, yeah, I, I remember at one point halfway through, I mean, you got to remember, I've been in the industry roughly for like 14 years. I think the last time I did any kind of physical activity was my sophomore year of high school playing what? softball. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> yeah. Like I don't do stuff. I sit and I play games and that's fine. And I like my life that way. And so I just remember specifically halfway through shooting the show, thinking to myself, Oh God, like, I don't know if I can, uh, if I'm going to survive this. And it was literally <laughs> just put my head down and make it happen because that was the only option in hindsight. Now that I'm away from that, I, and it did get easier over time, but at the, at the time, like, I'm so grateful. It was so much fun and I absolutely would love to do it again, but thank God I didn't know that much about it going into it. 
other than the paranormal, because I think it would have terrified me had I known how tough it was going to be. It's, so that would also answer how the one thing that was like the hardest thing to transfer over was, you know, hiking and breathing <laughs> and moving. It's a little different to like sit and talk about something at your house than it, or yeah. even on a set than it is to actually physically go yes. there. Yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah. 100%. I mean, in the middle of monsoon season. And so you're getting bit by mosquitoes. And I had to get all of these like um, shots before I was allowed to go anywhere. And it was... Um, and then you'd get there and it was like a hundred degrees and humid, like 90% humidity. And you'd just be like, Oh my God. I just remember this one part. And I know we're short on time, but it's such a good story. I'll try to make it fast. I just remember this one part. We're in the middle of a scene where we're talking to a guy about a tech tech, which is like the Cambodian version of a Bigfoot, And we have a fire lit and everything. And it took us forever to make that friggin' fire. And right when we light it and right when they're in the middle of the scene, just a downpour happens. And I'm talking the hardest rain that I've ever experienced in my life to the point where the river that we were sitting by started flash flooding. So we had to run and take cover in a cave, but we didn't know that the cave was full of bats. And (gasps) so we're sitting in the cave and (laughs) we have these headlamps on and the bats are like, what the fuck? Like we were sleeping (laughs) and they get super pissed and start dive bombing us and slapping us in the faces with their wings. And I'm like, I, how did I get here? (laughs) (laughs) That would be terrifying. Yeah. So it was, but you know, and, but what a great story. And now I can share that with my kid and his kids when he gets older and like, like, guess what your grandma did. So, you <laughs> know, slapped in the face it, by a bat. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, that's You're amazing. Now, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, But we have so many other great questions that we're just not going to have time to get to. I'm sorry, everybody, but I will hold on to them for the next time that we can get you on the show because I do want to ask about um, Vogue Leader. So for people out there that aren't familiar with Vogue Leader, how would you describe what Vogue Leader is? So one of my other passions that I had buried for a long time because I thought it wasn't cool to be uh, super, super feminine when I was trying to make it in gaming and just make it in general. I don't know. I just wasn't comfortable with myself, I guess. Uh, Actually, that's probably close to the truth (laughs) is that I really like fashion and I really like makeup and I really like, surprisingly, all this girly stuff. And I had buried it for a long time. And then I just think I got to a point where I'm like, why am I, why am I not like turning my nose at that? What is, what is my problem? And so I really kind of, um, and then on the flip side of it, it was also just my age as I was getting older and I, and my styles were changing, but I still loved gaming and I still love, for lack of a better phrase, nerdy, geeky stuff, fan girl stuff. I was not finding things that allowed me to um, celebrate that in in a fashionable way and things have changed there's definitely you know there's a lot more options now but um but yeah so that so there's a lot more options now and i'm i'm out here to try and celebrate that and that's what vogue leader tries to do is show you the alternative ways of representing what you like and what you're a fan of while also being stylish for the sake of because you like to be stylish and you like to put good clothes together um The new thing that I'm bumping up against with Vogue Leader is that now for my age, I'm wanting things that are more sustainable, better quality, can last a long time. And that's where the new road bump for Vogue Leader, I think, is, is like where now that gamers are getting older, they're in their 40s, there's more people getting involved in gaming because there's more options in how to game. And how how are they able to celebrate what they want to celebrate by also in, and also investing in things that reflect what how they want to represent their age bracket as well as their fandom you know cuz it's one thing to have a cool t-shirt but and that's great and i have a ton of those but i also at 42 going on 43 want like a really 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 nice Final Fantasy VII remake jacket or something, but something mm-hmm. that like I can wear out that doesn't look like I'm cosplaying. But if you were somebody that saw me on the street and you two were a big fan of Final Fantasy VII, you could look and you'd be like, "Oh shit, I know what that is," you know. And then you guys give each other the look. I guess it's the equivalent of like 
people that get those fancy cars and kind of do the little like while they're driving, like, hey, I see you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But with leggings, I, you know, I don't know. I, but it, yeah. It's, I feel like, you though. I feel you for sure. It's tough um, because so much of what is available in merchandising for gamer culture is still marketed and geared towards like late teens or early 20s. And then, you know, when you get into that age where you're like, yo, like I want something that is super representative of my passions, but isn't like a poster on a wall. Um, but it's mm -hmm. instead like a really cool framed piece of art that's really nicely done. You know, I, I feel you there. So that's why I think I love what you're doing so much with, with Vogue Leader. And we have a lot of people in the What's Good Games audience that are older, that want the exact same thing that you were describing. So I wanted to make sure that we talked about it because I'm sure there's people out there being like, yo, that's really cool. I didn't know she was doing that. Yeah. So where can people yeah, find Vogue your... Leader? Uh, you can find Vogue Leader on Instagram. And then on every other Wednesday, I've just started doing videos over on my YouTube channel, which you can find just by searching Jessica Chobot. Um, I also post every, every time I have a video up, I also post it to the socials because uh, that's how you do things on the internet. <laughs> so you can, you can eventually find it, but if you search it, it'll pop up. Yeah. And I just want to make the point too, really quick. Like I'm not against the t-shirts. Like there's, there should be entryway points for everyone. And I think that that is really important. So now we just need to work on the entry point for older, older adults that are into games. And that's kind I of the agree. goal for Go Leader. Yeah. Give me some yeah. nice subtle designs, some crisp, crisp stuff. Yeah. Out there. And yeah. it really, yeah. And it really is just design. Like it can really boil down to just give me a nice t shirt, but have a really cool, unique design on it. Don't just make it look like you put an, like you ironed on. A generic logo like the logo like, yeah exactly yeah, yeah there's there's ways to make all of these things unique and work and i and and justify paying maybe a couple extra bucks for the t-shirt could not agree with you more which is why we're working on revamping our what's good games merch coming soon to a merch store near you um oh well, i'm gonna hit you guys up because i need to find a good designer for the Chobot stuff. Yeah, yeah I, I've yeah. got some. I've got some names. We should. Uh, we'll sync up. We'll sync up later. Mm -hmm. um, but thank you so much for taking time out of your day to chat with Steimer and I. I know that we would love to have you back on and have like a, a longer conversation. There's so much that we didn't get to uh, to chat with you about, including your Animal Crossing um, island that you're all the way in on right now. <laughs> Oh yeah. Well, we, uh, I'm, that'll still be going. I promise you hit me up next, like anytime we can talk about that. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us again. And don't forget you guys can find everything that Jessica's doing. Um, she is on Twitter at Jessica Chobot on Instagram at Jessica Chobot. We'll put all of her links in the descriptions on both the podcast and the YouTube video. Um, enjoy the rest of your night and um, we look Thanks, forward to having guys. you back on the show. Thank you very much. Talk to you guys soon. Bye. Bye. Welcome back, everybody. It is the final segment of the What's Good Games podcast. An odd one this week, but we did want to make sure to um, get some talk in about Final Fantasy VII Remake in hands-on, but we only had Jessica for a very limited time. So, Steimer, mm -hmm. Final Fantasy VII Remake. This is where Woo. we're going to talk about it. I want to say two things. First... Um, we will absolutely be talking about this again uh, once Brittany is back on the show because I know that she has been dying to talk about this game and I think she's going to bring a lot of interesting context to the discussion. Um, also, I have to give a disclaimer that Square Enix provided us promotional advanced copies of the game. So thank you to Square for giving us copies of Final Fantasy VII Remake. And now we can talk about it. So you have some experience in Final Fantasy as a recap because I know we talked a little bit about this what last yeah. week so which ones have yeah, you played I, so I actually technically have never finished a Final Fantasy the closest one I got to was fuck, I don't remember which number it is it was on um the PlayStation Vita I think it was was it on my Vita no I don't remember what even platform I played it on uh that's how long ago it was but it was um Shit, I'm like, I just remember like 
the ha 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 it's like the ha 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 one which i know makes no sense to you but anyone listening to this is like ah it's that one like they okay. they will know immediately okay which final fantasy it is 10 i fucking I, there's too many numbers with final fantasy 10 a popular but, uh, one from what i've seen yeah i'm like trying to remember his stupid name like he's got a but all is, all that's coming to my brain right now is Cloud, which because obviously I've been playing Final Fantasy VII Remake. Yes. Um, I have played a little bit of Final Fantasy VII, the original. Not much, though. Um, I played it at when I very long time ago when I used to work at IGN. I went over to Ryan Clement's house, who was also a fellow editor, and I would play Final Fantasy VII on his PlayStation because I didn't have a... I don't know if I didn't have a PlayStation at that time or if I just didn't have that game i think i just didn't have a playstation i may have just had an xbox but whatever so i played like a decent chunk i thought of the game i don't actually know now because the the remake has obviously like distorted my realities of what the original was um and i was talking to britney over the weekend when i was playing this about it because i there were certain things that i i kind of went into this a little bit dark i knew obviously that it was Final Fantasy VII. I didn't know how much they really had changed. I didn't really know much. I'm like, it's prettier. I assumed that was it. But then, like, a few things had popped up, which we'll talk about later. But I had texted her, and I was like, I'm confused. Like, who is this person? <laughs> and she was like, oh, no, no, he's new. And I was like, ah, okay. So they've, like, added new characters to this, which I ha- actually had not realized because, again, hadn't really been paying much attention. Um, and I And they've definitely extended the the length of time that you are in certain areas so they've they've padded it out as you would say um but so far i've really been enjoying my time with it i think you and i are both at similar time stamps we're both roughly i'm like think i'm on chapter nine you're on chapter eight so like we're not very far off of each other mm-hmm. um and i i gotta say i'm i'm digging it and i'm eager to hop back in tonight and play some more yeah so What's been really interesting is kind of looking at how people who have had access to the game are feeling about it. Brittany and I did a little bit of a review roundup in Monday's episode, you know, kind of looking at all of the nines, which is really like the dominant score that we've seen, um, nines and eights, which is a fantastic and phenomenal score. But, you know, there are a couple outliers. There's obviously, you know, a couple of tens here and there. But there's also some much lower scores, like a like sixes, which I found to be quite surprising in, in my, you know, like I just, whenever I see somebody give a game a six, that to me means something's broken about the game. And there's definitely nothing broken that I've come across so far. I've been playing for about 15 yeah, no, hours. Either. Yeah, uh, at chapter eight. So I as you guys know, don't play Final Fantasy. I dabbled a little bit in Final Fantasy 15 because it was such an action-focused game that I wanted to try it. The characters just didn't click with me, uh, the boy band of Final Fantasy 15. Um, (laughs) And then, of course, I very infamously played a little bit of Final Fantasy 9 with Alexa Ray, and I never would have played that without her there coaching me through it. And then it just was not for me, just the style of that game. And so when all of the you know, build up for Final Fantasy VII Remake was coming out, I was like, well, that looks really pretty. And I got to play the demo at a couple press events. And I was like, well, you know, with the way that they were revamping the combat, I'll give it a try. But boy, oh boy, was I not ready for how much I was going to like this game. So I'm like really liking it, Steimer, like a lot. And yeah, I, I think um, you, you, you definitely would like this combat style a lot more. So obviously they have... That is the major change, uh, aside from the fact that now everything is 10 times more beautiful. <laughs> it's not pixel art anymore. Yeah. They got some graphical engine prowess behind it. But the combat is just so drastically different. So obviously in a lot of traditional Final Fantasy, like old school Final Fantasy games, it's all turn-based. Um, and for me, that was easier in the sense that like on the there, there are fights on like motorbikes and the fights on the motorbikes hell of a lot easier if you're just like picking out what you're going to be attacking them with versus trying to drive the fucking motorcycle and hit the guy. Um, 
which I was like, God damn it. This is the one time I actually wish this was back to turn based. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was oh, the, I love, I love that sequence. sequence. Um, before uh, we get too far down yeah, the road I, of our impressions, I started to interrupt you. Um, I wanted to make sure that we talked a little bit about what the game is. Uh, cause I know that there's probably people out there like me that are like, I still don't quite understand like what final fantasy is all about. Um, so just like sure. a quick, like synopsis, if this is a third person action adventure RPG, it, is following a character named Cloud Strife who tells you a lot in this game that he is an ex-soldier and that he had a lot of exposure to an essence called Mako, which you'll hear a lot about in the game as well. So Mako is like the lifeblood of the planet that they live on. It's this green substance that kind of gets energy into source. things. Yeah, an energy source and kind of makes people and, and animals and creatures and things act and behave in very specific ways. Um, and so you'll learn more about Mako and its effect on, on Cloud. And so he kind of lands in this city called Midgar and that's where all of this first episode, I'm using the word episode in giant air quotes here, um, is all based on, based in and you get to meet this band of what they dub terrorists, eco-terrorists in the game, but I think it's very clear that there's this divided narrative between is this group good or bad? And the name of the group is Avalanche and then there are several characters that are part of this group, Avalanche. Um, We've got yeah, there's Jesse and uh, Big Wedge. Wedge. And then, of course, you've got Barrett, Barrett. and Tifa who will become party members. Um, yep. And they are essentially are trying to disrupt Shinra, which is like President Shinra's company. That's like the like the evil corporation. It's, yeah. The that, mega corporation over, overlord of the planet who are currently basically they have all of these reactors the, the, the whole planet, or not the planet, I keep calling the planet, the whole city or whatever is like a, a series of plates. And then the slums are below on the actual earth level and all of the upper class are built above on this giant metal structure. Each sector has a reactor. That reactor is draining Mako. So that Mako, God damn it. I know. We were, we were talking about how like we, a taco. I wanted to say <laughs> Mako, like the Mako in Mass Effect, but it's, they say Mako. Um, in the game um, and it, it's just such an an interesting concept and I had mentioned when Brittany was asking me why I'm not attracted to Cloud <laughs> as a character and I was <laughs> well, like well he looks, he looks 12 I mean, yeah and for me like a lot of the Final Fantasy style and a lot of anime male characters in general tend to be a little bit more androgynous looking and I'm just not a big anime fan and it's not because I, I I don't like anime I just don't watch it there's just it's just never never really like spoken to me as a well, your boat correct it's just not an art style that I gravitate towards and so this is that's a big reason why I haven't really played any Final Fantasy because I was like I don't want to dump like 80 to 100 hours into a game whose art style I'm not like super jazzed about but I mean the art in this game is gorgeous the animation is something that I was not anticipating and how much you get to see the animation throughout the gameplay and the things that you guys have seen in these trailers that Square Enix has put out is the animation that you see in the game as well like it just looks that good and I was not prepared for for that how did you find the transitions between going in and out of cutscenes Dimer um going in and out of cuts I don't know I I think the only part where I ever feel like it doesn't look great is when it's um, minor side quests and you're talking to those NPCs. Like those NPCs look fairly what I would think of as a not older RPG, but like a couple years ago RPG, whatever. Um, and they're a little more stiff, right? And they their mouths don't really quite sync up with the lines. But everybody else, like the actual cutscenes and the actual characters the main characters doing things they they are very beautifully animated and like they look incredible everybody's it's eyes like, are so ooh, pretty their eyes yeah. they're that? also sparkly <laughs> they've got those just like big doe <laughs> eyes like, and everyone's got the very beautifully colored irises and everyone has like a ring light on them at all times <laughs> exactly. somehow it's amazing yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, they're all so beautiful and their hair all flows fucking perfect. And Hair is hard I mean, to I, animate, I, but dang it, Jesse's hair looks so good. I'm like, dang. Yeah, all of their hair. Like, Tifa's hair looks really good. Um, yeah, I use it, Jesse. And then uh, Aerith's hair looks great. Like, everyone's hair is 
fucking on point in this game, which is good because I honestly would expect nothing less of a Final <laughs> Fantasy game. Like, it's all about the hair. It's all about the eyes. They nailed it. 10 out of 10 hair and eyes in Final Fantasy VII <laughs> Remake. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the gameplay. So and the things that, you know, we we really liked about the game. What what to you do you think has been something that has really stood out and grabbed you? And you've been like, gosh, I really like how they did that. So for me, I I really like the more action-oriented combat. Like I said, um, Traditionally, I don't mind turn-based. I'm not like you, Andrea, where I'm like, Absol- I, I don't, I'm not turned off by it. I'll play it and usually enjoy myself. Um, but that being said, I do think it was kind of a breath of fresh air to have um, the more physicality and especially to see the animations of some of these things in action is really fun. Uh, seeing Cloud with his giant sword, like, yeah, I want, I want to swing the sword. I want to hit people with it. <laughs> like, it was kind of the whole point. So it really is satisfying to have that that combat. Um, this is a weird minor road tangent, but we're going to go there. Um, the one thing that I actually like about this, that's a weird thing, uh, is the fact that you can turn the difficulty up and down. So because <laughs> there, I was just coming off of Ori where you're like, you can't. You pick Ori at one difficulty. Yep. That's your difficulty forever. And I've been working really long hours. So while over the weekend, I was playing the game just on normal. And not really, I mean, there were some fights that were a little tougher, but I was like, you know what? It's fine. I can get through them. And I did. But I was exhausted during the week. I was just like, I do not have the energy. I cannot be bothered. I can't think about what I need to do right now. I just need to smash it. <laughs> so I just, bu- I just bumped it down to easy and like rolled through some fights and was like, yeah, this is exactly what I needed. On this moment. <laughs> Embrace the baby ass baby mode. Praise baby ass baby mode. And like now once I've recovered from work for a little bit, I'll probably bump it back up to normal because I do feel like easy feels a little too easy at times. But I love the flexibility that the game is giving me and allowing me to just play it the way that I want to play it. Yes. As opposed to being like, you must do X. It's I don't ever feel like the game is imposing on me. I feel like it is just allowing me to explore the world and to explore the characters. And that is something that I really love. Yeah, I, I'm with you there. I haven't dropped it down to easy yet because I think I've been just enjoying the battle system a lot more than I ever anticipated. And I have certainly had a moment where I got very upset on a fight that I lost. i um, looking at you, Reno. Um, oh, just, really? Yeah. Oh, uh, man, yeah. I, I hated that fight. And we're not going to talk about it. You know, we had said that, you know, we're, we're going to make this spoiler free as far as like, you know, some of the major story beats and what happens, of course. We will be doing a spoiler sure, cast, yeah. I imagine, down the line. Uh, but that day is not today, mostly because Britt's not here. We haven't we, finished the game. Also, we, I was like, we haven't finished the game. <laughs> so that'd be really, game. A, really a tough one. Um, but, you know, kind of going back and talking about the differences and what I really think is interesting about this battle system. So obviously it's third person combat and each of the characters in your party has a different specialty and you have to get to know these specialties and then you have to equip your gear to kind of maximize what their specialties are. So for Cloud with his giant sword, he can also do a variety of special attacks with the sword and he has magical abilities as well. So you have this ATB gauge and fill, you have to fill the gauge in order to be able to use part of the gauge or the meter to execute some of these special abilities versus just, you know, smashing the basic attack button and swinging your sword around, which is very effective with specific enemy types. But other enemies And that types- also fills your ATB bar Correct. by hitting them. Um, yeah. So learning all of the jargon around Final Fantasy Battle System was something that I struggled with when I first started playing this game. And quite frankly, like, I got frustrated with. And I was like, this is dumb and I'm mad at this and they should have explained this and this. And (laughs) thankfully, John was there watching me during the first part. And um, he was like, yo, you have to do this. This is what this means. He was like, this is what this potion does. This is what this item does. And that's what Alexa Ray had done for me when I was playing Final Fantasy IX. She was like, this is what all this laundry list of items does in your inventory. Um, And I do wish that Square had taken a little bit more time to explain or tutorialize some of those things. And now I don't know if on easy mode, some of that stuff is more tutorialized or not, but if it is, that's cool. I just don't even know if it's necessary on easier mode. Like I think if you play this game on easy, like you're never going to need to use a Phoenix down 
um, because you're probably just not going to die. Like if yeah. you do bless your heart, I don't know. <laughs> like you're, I don't know what you're doing, but like <laughs> maybe it's their first it's time playing easy. with a controller. Who knows? That's um, true. Yeah. Um, but it's just, if you are Phoenix down, will revive you. Yes. So just use that. It's <laughs> think like the Phoenix. Woo-hoo! Yes. So there's just like a, some, a little bit of a learning curve for people who aren't familiar with the final fantasy, uh, jargon, like I mentioned. Um, but you know, now that I'm like 10 to 15 hours, well, I said 15 hours in, I kind of got more comfortable around like the seven to 10 hour mark and really understanding. But then of course, that's when they added more items that I'm like, what am I going to do with all of these things? What does it even mean to be silenced anyway? Don't you love hoarding? Yes, I do love that so far I haven't run into any inventory restrictions, which I really love because I I hate encumbrance more than all sorts of shit. (laughs) No, Cloud has some magical pockets in those giant pants of his. (laughs) They just fill up. (laughs) Those Mary Poppin pants, I'm into it. They sure are, yeah. It's a, it's, it's, his pants are interesting. I actually yeah. really love his top. <laughs> like super into the sleeveless turtleneck. Yeah. Looks nice. The styling of all of the characters is really awesome. I just keep looking at Tifa going, that outfit wouldn't be that hard to cosplay. But then I would have to do oh, a lot no. of crunches because she's got mad, mad flat stomach. <laughs> that and like your butt would be out because like that skirt real short. Yeah. But, I actually you know like what? Jessie's outfit better. Even though she has boob armor, which, you know, we'll set aside. I yeah. still think it's a really cool outfit. <laughs> I love Aerith's jacket. Not, I don't like her dress. Her dress is whatever. Yeah. Her jacket. That red jacket. Dope. And I'm like, I actually just want to buy that exact jacket. Like, can you just make it? I will. We were just, as we were just talking about with Jessica, like, let's, can you just make some of these clothes in real life? I would buy Cloud's turtleneck and I would buy Aerith's jacket. Like, those are things I would wear. I think maybe not together, but maybe together. Who knows? Uh, maybe it would look really great together. It, it might. You never know. I literally just Googled this jacket to be like, where can I, where can I buy this jacket? Um, yeah. And apparently there are places online that sell this jacket, BT dubs. Nice. So a, that'll be a fun, that'll I'll be a fun a... Google search for you later. Um, yeah. So going back to the battle system, What I really love about it is that it feels like I can have the essence of what a turn-based battle would be, utilizing all of my different party members' special abilities and spells, but it feels way more accessible and way faster than some other games have have done it. Now, when you think about, you know, third-person battles and RPGs, a problem that a lot of them suffer from is that you get buried in the menus while you're trying to fight, and it kind of takes the tension away from the battle when you're like scrolling through, finding a health item to eat, scrolling through, finding a potion to apply. And it kind of feels like it really drags on the pacing of the battle. And I think Final Fantasy VII Remake has really nailed the marriage between utilizing all of these items that you have in your inventory for each individual party member, but while also not taking away from the excitement and the tension in the battle. I mean, the music is a big factor. The, the music is phenomenal. The music is in this so game. good. Um, yes. And I love that they have like a little music collecting, like mini quest in the game, which is cool. Um, and then the tactical mode that you use, which kind of slows down time. So it, I mean, when I say slows down, I mean, it really slows it down, but you can still see. But it is still moving, yeah. Yeah, you can still see characters moving towards you because there have been plenty of times when I've gone into tactical mode when there's like an enemy like r- literally about to like slice my face it's off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Ex- you're like, oh God. <laughs> exactly like that. Um, but it feels like the way that they designed those menus that you can really flip through them quickly. And once you get to know where each of the different things is on those menus, you can really execute different spells and abilities uh, really fast and get right back into the, you know, the full time action, which I think is awesome. But they also allow you to do hotkey mapping to each individual character. So, you know, one of the party members that you're going to fight with, you know, a lot in the beginning is Barrett, right? So he's got this big, you know, um, mini gun, like attached to his arm. arm. Yeah, it's awesome. And so you'll want to swap between Cloud and Barrett in a variety of situations to do ranged and up close combat. And so you can 
hotkey different abilities for Barrett and Cloud to the same buttons, but then it does different things depending on which character you're controlling. And so what I loved about that is part of one of the strategies I did was I mapped the same elemental spells to the same buttons, but then kept potions and things like that the same. So I didn't have to kind of memorize a bunch of different button patterns. And I found it to be a really fun way to engage in combat. It's just like, it's just, it just feels really good in a way that I, I wasn't expecting because I just, to be honest, like I just have never been impressed with JRPG battle systems and like they don't feel visceral enough for me. I mean, cause as you guys know, who are listening and watching, like I love a lot of shooters. I love games that have a lot of, you know, combat systems that feel very action focused. And to me, a lot of these JRPGs, you know, I felt like I was just always buried in menus and I don't feel that way with Final Fantasy VII Remake, and I love that I don't feel that way. Yeah, I think another thing that you will also probably enjoy because you don't feel that way is, like, the one of the fun things about Final Fantasy in general is, like, the scale to which the, the enemies are at times. A little bit... There's, I don't know in this one if it will get anything as big as, like, a God of War scale, but there are some, like, really big fantastical things that you... Again, at least from my past experience with Final Fantasy, I never made it super far in seven, but that you get to fight and you're just like, what the fuck? How am I going to fight this? But like, then you do and you kill it and you're like, ha, I'm the best. Yeah, it kind of feels a little really bit like um, like a like Bayonetta or Devil May Cry, right? Where you come across these like gargantuan enemies that you have to fight. Um, and I'm like, how am I going to use, you know, Tifa's ability on this thing? <laughs> I don't She's know. She's gonna punch it to death. <laughs> yeah. So if you don't know, uh, just running through quick, the few first few characters that will join your party: Barrett, machine gun arm guy, as you said. Tifa is your long term or long term, <laughs> your childhood friend is what I meant to say. Uh, and she she punches. She a punchy girl. Um, and then uh, Aerith, who will join your party, is a she's the one like mage basically. She's got a staff. She'll twirl it and shoot magic people. And can we talk for a second about this twirl? I think it's a, a testament to how uniquely they designed each of these party members that they all feel like their animations and skill sets and not obviously just the way that they're voiced, which I really haven't been enjoying the voice acting, but just like the way that they fight, the stances they take, the the animations they have are just so well done. They feel so unique to each character. I remember my first battle with Aerith in the party and I and I controlled her because I wanted to see how the magic worked. And I was just like, gosh, she feels so dainty. <laughs> she does. Yeah, no, she's very light. Like, and even, which is kind of fun to be like, pew, 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 pew. <laughs> like very daintily like, hee hee, here's some magic. But then it like drains their health. And you're like, hee hee, yes, I <laughs> murder you. Uh, <laughs> I murder you from afar and gently. That's how I feel. And then, yeah, it, it was, it's actually interesting you bring that up because then switching when you switch over to someone like Tifa who like has to kind of get up in there and really punch at people, it feels different. And then when you switch to Barrett, who's just, all, first of all, a large dude, um, feels a little different and you have a little bit more weight to him because he's number one large and number two has a giant machine gun on his arm. Um, so yeah, they, they did really do an, a nice job. So when you, when you switch between the characters in your party, the battle will feel different. Yes. I mean, I could keep going on and on about the battle system, but I do want to talk about, of course, some other things in the game that I thought was really great. So one of the things that I think they really excelled at with this game is the dynamic between the different party members. Now, as you guys know, I obviously did not play the first game, um, the original game. And so I don't know how the writing was and how the dynamic felt in between the original party members. But I love that it feels like each of these characters has such a specific point of view and none of them feel like they're just like tacked on or side characters. They feel like they have a place and they have their each have their individual moments. And I just kind of love the individual personalities. And I think that it's such a, a nice departure because I think back to my time playing Final Fantasy IX and how I renamed all the characters, which I admit was a mistake. Should not have renamed them. But, but I'm, they allow you to do it. Yes, they do. And so I, I, I thought that they were just going to be my characters. I didn't realize I needed to know that they had real names. 
I was just like, oh, yeah, I know. I, I, you, I mean, you could do that in obviously like seven in the beginning or the original as well. And uh, I am glad that they're like, no, you're not doing that here. Like these are the characters. Here's who they are. And yeah. I think that was a, the correct choice. Because like you said, if you're playing this game and like Tifa's coming at you as Britney Spears, it's going to feel a little different than if her name is Tifa. <laughs> so. That's very true. Um, Britney would be definitely the name I would go with in going continuing my pop star um, theme with my Final Fantasy characters. Um, but I just, I have been so impressed with so much of this game. I absolutely see why people are very happy with what they've done. And from what I've read of other reviews, it seems like they've been you know, very faithful and recreating very specific parts of the game and that people have been very, really happy with that. What I do want to mention, though, is there were a couple of things that I was like a little disappointed with. I was like, hey, you know, if you're going to spend this gigantic budget remaking this game and making it this episodic thing, you know, like, why wouldn't you fix a couple of things? And like the one thing that keeps standing out to me is some of the traversal. So there's sections of the game that are not fully open world, but they feel like open-ish instances where you can explore and go find secrets and things like that. And that there's still some antiquated ways of moving through the world. And it seems to me that they probably restricted some of Cloud's movement because they wanted to preserve some of the animation of his character models. And I just don't know why, if you're gonna like go all the way into the 3D remake that you wouldn't just like go all the way especially with the work that the team did and I know that the teams aren't identical the team that worked on Final Fantasy 15 but I mean it's still the same company like this idea that they would put all this work into an open world Final Fantasy game like 15 and at least take some of that tech and bring it in to the remake I was a little bit bummed about but it wasn't enough of an annoyance that it like bothers me like on an ongoing basis it's more of like a ugh, this is annoying that I have to like move in this weird way. Like, for example, you have to stand in these like highlighted spots to go up and down specific sets of stairs or to go across specific walkways to like wedge yourself like in smaller spaces. Like you'll see this high blue highlighted square that Cloud has to stand in and then it like initiates the movement animation. And yep. it just felt like it was a little overused in what I've seen so far. I'm just like, why didn't you just like let the player control cloud there like I can jump over here but then I can't jump over here I can walk off this ledge over here but then I can't walk off this ledge just felt like there was a lot of inconsistencies in the character it's a, traversal it's a lot more and I put this very mildly more like traversal puzzle versus traversal itself like they want you to find the way they intended for you to get to a spot they don't want you to like ever experiment or figure out on your own how to get there um, it's like, did you find, like, as you said, the blue square, <laughs> like, did you find it? <laughs> Cause if you could get, find it, you're fine. You're going to get there just fine. Which is why I say puzzle is very light. Cause it's not really hard to figure it out. It's just like you, you can only go a very specific way and the game, it's very linear. Like the game is like, no, no, you must do this. If you feel like getting that box over there. Um, right. And I think, so yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, and I think the reason why it kind of stood out to me is because the game does reward you for doing exploration, right? They do want to encourage you to like go around that corner. Maybe you're going to find a chest with some materia inside or maybe you'll find a container, you know, with some potions that you're going to need for a battle that's down the road or what have you. And so I, I like that they reward exploration in this game, but it also at the same time felt like you said it's very designed exploration. Like, oh, we want you to explore only down this one path because it leads to this one chest. But like this other thing, don't worry about. <laughs> the other thing is not worth your time. Yeah. Don't go there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that's definitely what it is. It. Um, I personally didn't mind it because I feel that is fairly normal for a for a game like this um but i also didn't play uh final fantasy bro squad so i'm not sure what they updated yeah i mean it i don't i don't know who from that team also worked on this game i would have to reach out to square enix about that and ask them specifically like what the overlap in the team was in, in relationship to this aspect of the game design but 
that was just one thing. But I think it speaks volumes that like that was like the smallest nitpick for my time with the game so far. And like I thought I was not going to be into the storytelling because there's a lot of JRPGs that I just like spend my time eye rolling because I'm like, oh, God, this is so annoying the way that they're talking to each other and they're so emo and dramatic and I can't deal and I just get frustrated. And there was some of that in the beginning where I was just like, really, come on. We're going to do another big sword joke. Really? Because <laughs> there was a, I mean, there was it a is lot a of that. Sword. <laughs> it is. It's a big sword. It's, ju- it's a Did giant you, sword. Could you bring yourself to switch him out of it? I couldn't. Out of the buster sword? Yeah. Yeah. I'm using I'm using a different weapon because it had more materia oh. slots. I'm all about that materia. I know materia is great, but I, I just was like, it feels wrong to me to play this game when he's, when he's got any other weapon, like this is his weapon. This is his sword. I'm with you, but I am going to go back. Cause you, as you upgrade other weapons for your characters, you keep the skill points. And so you can take all of those skill points and then put them into the original weapon that they started with. And I'm, par- I'm planning to go back now that I'm unlocking more points in the tree where I can add additional materia slots and I'm getting other pieces of gear that have additional materia slots so just as a recap materia is essentially like a gem system and each of these individual gems has like a buff that it gives you and then you slot the gems it's a spell system yeah exactly um, and I mean and and each at- spell can upgrade over time so like mm-hmm. if you have if you have a gem or yeah materia gem and it's lightning you can slot that into your sword. And then in battle, when you hit the buttons, the tactical will go into tactical mode, go to spells, it will be there. And if it has like three stars below it, that means you can max that up to, to that amount. Um, so as you play and as you use it more, it will gradually fill the meter and become more powerful, more powerful along the way. Yeah, and it's great because as you get deeper into the materia system, there's a lot of them that will have passive abilities, which is nice. You know, having to actively manage all of these different spells. Um, and then there's ones that are more, you know, team based, where you can heal allies and you know you can buff other people, et cetera. There's um, it's interesting how they really do kind of let you tailor to your specific play style while also reminding you, hey, like you're going to need these different abilities for different types of enemies, depending on the enemies, like, you know, immunities or weaknesses, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the RPG part of the RPG, yeah. of the action RPG. Yeah, that whole, that whole system. Yeah. The whole rock, paper, scissors thing. I'm, I'm with you though, that I, I like the, I like the Buster Sword and John very accurately noted the reason why it's so big is because he has to use it to block and so he can fit very perfectly behind it <laughs> he's holding he's it very small like he's a small dude but he's uh, like he's cut like i want my arms to look like his arms like that yeah. is my goal now he's ripped it's how do i do enough push-ups to be as jacked as cloud um i guess you gotta carry <laughs> a big sword around all the time i mean i can try <laughs> i'll do my best i don't know how the fuck it stays there it's like magnetic Ba-ding! it just, just sticks to the back of him it's, it's um, just like the mary poppins pants you know just yeah, it's gotta, true. Just, just gotta sort go of magic with it. we don't understand. It's a different type of materia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but we definitely look forward to talking more about this. Is there another thing that you wanted to cover? Um, no, I just think when you were talking about like how the story is unfolding, or at least how they're talking to each other, um, I, I the only character I got slightly irritated with was Aerith because she's a little a little much for me, yes. but. <laughs> I know but exactly I what you mean. Really... <laughs> <laughs> otherwise, I'm, I'm actually enjoying Cloud a lot, and I'm enjoying how they are playing him. Because before, I think it was, I don't remember how many weeks ago it was in the show, but we had that article where um, the designer behind him was like, I don't know if anyone's going to like him. I made him, I can't remember the word he used. Oh, yes. Uh, I'll look remember? this up. Yeah, but he's basically like, I made him kind of, uh whatever negative negative usually associated word here um and so far i think that they've played him well and that yes he is aloof and yes he is kind of a dick sometimes but he also seems to be getting you know a little bit warmer or at least trying like he is trying to human and it's kind of interesting to see yeah i'm trying to find the article um the whole time 
Um, I just kept thinking, man, I feel like Cloud is definitely like channeling Steimer's salty aesthetic with his <laughs> attitude because he's just like he is surly. There's just a lot of he's times where like, he's whatever. Just, how much money do I get? And like the the quips, the jokes are so well done between the characters um, that there's just so much that you just have to laugh at the way that Cloud reacts to some of the these like just kind of shenanigans of the people around him. Um, can we talk for a second about this like dynamic he has with Jesse and how she keeps playing like this damsel in distress when she's really like super powerful, like with, you know, her explosives and things like that. Um, but that she's always like, oh, you're so hunky. Oh, Cloud, save me. I can't figure out if it's an act or not. It, I mean, she's an actress. So, yes. Like, or I, mean, I think it's like it's it's a. It's like a little column A, a little column B, I think, with her, where she's like, yeah, he's obviously an attractive dude, but he's clearly borked. Like, I don't know. <laughs> so I'm going to, I think she just kind of does that with a lot of people or like, that's how she plays it. That's how she tries to play men. Um, and I think she wants him to be around. Granted, I could be totally wrong. Maybe she just really wants his, wants his nuts. I don't know. Maybe, but, maybe uh, in the end that they're finally going to hook up or she's going to like, I told John, I go there. I feel like they're setting Jesse up to like be a double agent that she's like really oh, maybe, yeah. that she's like really like all up in in his grill now. But then then like later on down the line, it's just going to turn out that she's actually been Shinra all along. Oh, my God. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Again, I never finished the original. I don't know. <laughs> I, I have no idea either. Happened. If that actually happens, this is not a spoiler. I don't, I don't think know. It will. I, yeah, no, I don't think it. I mean, I, I have a hunch it does not, but I mean, sure. Crazier shit has happened, I suppose. Yeah. Um, I do think it's fun to see the summons. The oh, so we didn't in addition even talk to materia, about the summons. Oh. Yeah. It, like in go, addition no, go, to materia, go ahead. You, you can um you can slot summons into your equipment. Like everybody has one summon spot. And the first one you get is Ifrit, who's just like this fucking massive hulk of a beast. It's like a giant demon. Fire. Yeah. Yeah. He's a giant fire demon. He just like roars around. It's it's cool. It's just like cool to see that it's so cool. enter the battle and just come like help your ass out. And once the so there's a meter and as you can summon it, it will like come up. And then once it hits that meter, you can summon. Then they come and then the meter starts to count down. And then basically once the meter is done they pull off one mega spell that just is super cool looking uh it would depend on which summon you have so with you free it's just like this inferno that surrounds the enemy it just blasts them into oblivion it is super cool i really like uh, i like them a lot i was not prepared for how awesome that moment was going to be i mean like because i'd heard of you know the summons before and you know i had seen them in, in final fantasy 15 but I mean, like being in a really intense battle and then finally seeing the the summons meter when it because it only unlocks and very like randomly the very specific enemies. It's not like you can just use the summons whenever you want to. It's like only You're fighting like four tiny dudes. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's definitely there's a couple of fights that I was like, man, it would be real nice to have a summons right now. Um, but they only trigger with very specific enemies and, and bosses that you find in the world. And so when it finally happened, I was like, yes, this is so cool. So there's, I won't spoil any of the other summons because Ifrit is the first summons that you find in the game. Um, you know, we think that that's probably a pretty fair game. But there's one that I have picked up now that I still haven't been able to use because it's never been triggered. And I'm like very anxious for it to, for it to happen. Oh, have you? So one of the side quest people... I forget his name is a child and he will help Chadley. get you new types. Yeah. Chadley. Get you new types of materia. <laughs> and then he also like will put you into VR where you can fight summons and get summons for your uh, crew. Um, so that's one way to also get them in case you're wondering or worried that you, if you don't get lucky and find them or whatever, um, there will definitely be ways for you to get your summons. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting thing that they've done, adding all of this extra ways to keep playing in the game for people who are just really having a great time or want to practice in the battle system. Um, the VR arena that Chadley has is is one way to do that. There's a couple other ways as well. And we can talk more about some of the stuff that we find later in the game, you know, in the weeks to come, because we know we want you guys to be able to discover a lot of this too. So I think it's good that we're kind of like stopping the conversation at about, you know, 
Um, what I imagine to be like midway through the game, maybe a little less than midway through the game. Um, from what I've heard, most people spend 30 to 40 hours playing. Um, I think IGN put out an article where they said their slowest player took around 45 hours and their fastest player took around like 32 hours or something like that. Um, but oh. that there's things that you can do in the game after like the final, whatever the final fight is, and that there's other things that you can run around in the world and do. And I thought that that was a nice way to like give players more opportunity to spend time in the world. But man, God it's... knows we need something to do. <laughs> it's true. It's very true. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm anxious to get back to it. I'm anxious to play more. And I, I can't wait to have this conversation with Brittany and kind of hear her perspective on it as somebody who's been such a giant fan of the franchise and has been really looking forward to this remake. Um, but yeah, I'm glad that, you know, we're both having fun. And if you're like me and you were like, yo, Final Fantasy isn't my thing, I would encourage you to look at some other gameplay videos or maybe look at some other reviews and maybe go out on a limb like I did. And it might surprise you. You might like it more than you thought you did. Also, shout out to Wedge. He's just the greatest. <laughs> Wedge is great. <laughs> We like Wedge. Yeah. All right. That's going to do it for our show for this week. Um, thank you for hanging out with us tonight. And thanks again to Jessica Chobot for joining us for the first half of the show. She was fantastic. We had so many questions submitted from you guys. So we are going to hang on to those because we definitely want to get her back. Have so much more to talk about with her and on all the projects that she's working on. We really didn't even get to talk about what she's doing on her YouTube channel right now. But we'll put all of her links down below um, in the description so you guys can go follow her or check out what she's doing and of course you know expedition x on discovery and don't forget we've got our live show uh, mondays at 11 a.m pacific time on twitch.tv slash what's good games and for now have a great weekend and we'll see you next time bye everybody